Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for joining us for another episode, episode 28 of Black Coffee and Crime. Um, today, of course, my name is Brandy and we're joined by Jackie and probably in a little bit, Brandy uh, Wingate is, excuse me, Brandy Watts. She's been Brandy Watts for like 20 years. Um, Brandy Watts will be joining us via audio. So, um, you know, if she pops in, don't worry about it. So she, she'll be joining us in a minute. So um, just a brief description of the show. We are just nosy ass people who like to talk about crime, current events and other shit that we find on the Al Gore's internet. Um, we bring you facts, but we really just like to talk in a very conversational, unscripted way about the things that we find. So, you know, follow along. Um, if you miss something and we didn't mention it, please let us know in the, mm-hmm. the uh, comments. Hit us up on um, uh, Instagram at Black Coffee Crime. And then also Facebook, Black Coffee Crime, where you'll also find um, next the incoming weeks um, subjects and also stories that we find. So that being said, we're going to go ahead and start off the church announcements. Yes. Okay. The church announcements are as follows. This Is this communion? Communion on first Sunday. Okay, so I miss communion. So we just going to have a little baby. In honor of, yes, whoever. Whichever savior, a uh, deity, whatever, we're just going to do that today. Any so, yeah. <laughs> the church announcements are as follows. Please um, obey your ushers, respect your pastor at all times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is 2021, so we still always start off with a new building fund every year. We ain't, we ain't seen your ties come through. Okay? <laughs> now, we haven't said it in a long time. We like the kind the jingles. Oh we'd man. rather have the kind that folds. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So go ahead and get those envelopes in. Your ushers will be coming down the aisles. Mm-hmm. Um, we really don't have any uh, church announcements for this week. Um, yeah, the only thing, hey, if you have any suggestions for upcoming shows, let yeah. us know anything that you want to hear about, any interesting stories, we will um, add those things to the list, research them, and then bring it back to you. Um, again, if there's anything that we miss, let us know. If we miss a date, um, incorrect name, or even incorrect information that we bring you, just let us know. But at all times, be respectful because we want to be able to match that energy. Um, we're not here to be malicious. Like I said, we're not law enforcement professionals or anything. We're just nosy, and we like to talk about it. All right, so those are the announcements as follows. Please govern yourselves accordingly. So we had the inauguration, so we have a new president, um, a new vice president, Madam Vice President, thank you very much. So um, a lot of firsts when it comes to uh, the the new vice president, first female, first um, vice president of African or African-American descent and also of Asian descent. So she's she's hitting it, you know, on all levels. very proud of her i will say that i missed the inauguration i got home from work i turned it on so the tv's on i slept through the whole thing (laughs) slept through the whole thing but i did see some clips and i will say that i got emotional when she like this and she said her oath and it became real that this woman was really yeah i'm back howard Howard University graduate, uh, AKA black woman, Asian woman, all of just, you know, attorney general state of California, senator from California, very powerful. It was, it was great. It was great. And uh, we can all get into Michelle Obama, period. I, I don't care. She just. Man, sis said, if I'm gonna take the inauguration. Off her, she's so. Oh, that she's so fly. It's like ridiculous. That outfit was ridiculous. Hey, B, B has joined us. Um, <laughs> yes, sis walked down there. When that door opened, she walked in like she knew she was fine. You hear me? And she strutted. Like if y'all don't know what a strut is, if y'all don't know what it means to walk into a room and mean that I am the shit, that was Michelle Obama. That was it. Mm-hmm. She said, I am the end and the beginning. You hear me? <laughs> that's it. I am the alpha and the omega. That's it. That's it. Nothing else comes after me. 
I mean, and she kind of walk with her head down. You know when you walk with your head down a little bit. Then you get that. Even Obama was walking like she was. But he always he always gives that aura like look look at me look at me look. He in, he's so in love with her. It's so oh. Listen, oh. If you can't look at me like Barack look at Michelle, you just keep your ass to going, okay? She has a um, you know her becoming, which was great. Mm -hmm. Um her becoming you know her little documentary on netflix and even in behind the scenes he is so in love with her like she'd be like will you leave me alone and he'd be and like that he one. just a okay. little puppy dog just she's educated like, she is you ain't never seen her swat her man's hand away like somebody else oh, no, no. <laughs> wow. She left him walking at the at the plane. She walked off like it's <laughs> over. Bitch, bye. <laughs> she said, "I ain't got I ain't got no time for you." They got no time. Plane. She just kept moving. I was like, she just she was that. gone. <laughs> she didn't even care how it looks. That no, I care. <laughs> now, you know that they have like a send off. Like okay, so. You know, like people, staff, and everything supposed to send them off. Only the only people that showed up was a few staffers and his the immediate family, like the kids. Those are the only mm -hmm. people that showed up. And also his petty ass. Let me tell you what he did. He fired the senior um, staff, White House staff, the day of the inauguration, so that no one would be there to greet the Bidens and open the doors of the White House. Wow. They're standing outside of the White House. Before someone came and opened the doors, because the Cheeto, former Cheeto in chief, fired the chief butler staff. That's sad. That is petty as fuck. That's petty. How you send everybody home? <laughs> we ain't got no work. Go home. No, and they know good and well they got work to do. But you tell me. They talk a shit on the way out the door. They're like, nigga, you don't even run this place no more. But he's still like, go on now. Gone. <laughs> Let your boss tell you you can leave early. What you gonna do? Well, I, I mean, because it's fired. a big day. Fired. Uh, he fired them. It wasn't just go home. He fired them. So they had to be escorted out. They would have had no choice but to um, comply. So they were fired and no one knew. So during the inauguration or whatever, that's when that, that happened. I was laughing because I seen a friend's meme. Well, not a meme, but she posted a status on Facebook. Did you hear what Trump did today? And she was like, nope, me either. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody heard from him. So that's a blessing in and of itself. Like he don't got Twitter. He don't got nothing. We ain't got to worry about him. No. All. And all of those, uh, the, the insurrectionists, they are uh, from QAnon. They are feeling really betrayed right now. Um because they were under the impression that they would get pardons and now they're not he's left these people literally out to dry and um that's what y'all get the mm -hmm. thing that killed me where these people said the president told me to do it like a little kid like well they told me to do it like it, it, just because somebody somebody's telling you commit a crime and you say okay like now look at you <laughs> I, I mean, I can't even wrap my mind around that. Now look at you. So yeah, they ain't they, crying they, in the corner. They ain't turn around. They posted something. Please. I I he, said, he said he he told us to. If you don't shut, your well, he don't work here no more. Me to go rush the Capitol and storm in there. I'm gonna be looking like looking at him like, uh uh. There was a priest. <laughs> A priest that has been relieved of his uh, uh, whatever vestments, whatever they call them. Uh, a priest, y'all, that uh, that was at the Capitol insurrection. What? A firefighter was at the Capitol insurrection. So, and then of course we do know about all of the lawmakers Wait. that were there, sheriffs and local lawmakers, mayors, and all the people that were there. So it's just really bad. And it, what's really bad is these are the people who you you go to for advice and help and these are the people who are really hating you because of your person of color or of belonging to the opposite um, political party so that's what y'all get whatever you get is what you deserve um another story we found on al gore's internet this week 
Uh, and we did post it to Instagram and Facebook. Out of, I want to say it's Missouri, but hold on just one second. Let me double check. Kansas City. Uh, doesn't say if it's Kansas or Kansas City, uh, Missouri. But 21-year-old uh, Titania Coppage went, took a gun, and confronted her brother's, her 16-year-old brother's alleged killer. Apparently, they might have got into some sort of scuffle. She shoots him. She kills him. And from the picture that we posted, she's okay with what she did. Um, so in the story, this is from, I believe this is from uh, the Neighborhood Talk. And uh, says, um, Kansas City woman was hit with a second degree murder charge after authorities say she tracked down the man suspected of murdering her teenage brother last week and killed him. According to the uh, AZ family, uh, she even sent a text to her dead brother's phone mm -hmm. letting him know that she took care of the person responsible for ending his life so soon. Listen, let me tell you, this happened on January 13th. Her brother's, brother, his, her brother was sixteen. When 16. did her brother get killed? Um, I don't know. That I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is this young woman, I'm not condoning murder. But I don't know about y'all. Uh Brandy, you don't have you do have a brother. Jackie, you do have a brother. Uh And you did, if I can do it. Ain't no need me lying. I mean, yeah. I, I would, in, in, that, in those moments, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you can't think of nothing else. You can't sleep. You can't, he's 16. He was only a baby. So you can't sleep. You can't eat. And if you a boss like she is, I don't care how nobody felt about my opinion about it. You know, a lot of, I did post that also on the personal page. And a lot of people were like, well, yeah, I understand, but she got caught. This girl does not care that she got. She didn't even care. Yeah, she didn't her, care. Her motivation was, I need to confront this person. Now, I don't know. It says secondary murder, meaning that she she didn't do it with, you know, forethought. But she did have a gun on her, what she said was self-defense because they got into a scuffle. Um, but she wanted to avenge her brother. When you talk about eye for an eye and all of that, she had the courage to go ahead and confront her brother's alleged murderer. Um, and I don't know what type of situation, if it was a gang situation, drug situation, I don't know. But she had the courage, this young woman, to confront her brother's murderer, alleged murderer, and not even let the police botch it or not pay attention to it because it's a young black man, whatever the reason why she went there. She, that girl went there, she is a true, 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 true ride or die. Um, she doesn't care by her expression. She does not care what her fate is. Just think about it. You you have your brother's killer is out walking the streets, and you know he's walking the streets, and the police haven't done anything, or you know, or, or in her mind they didn't do enough. You know where he's at. You know where he's been. He, and he's just free, and your brother's dead. Yeah, and if you have any male relatives or male members of your family or whatever uh, friends. You're like, y'all gonna do something? All right, bet, I got you. I got mm -hmm. you. And the bad part of it is to compound the tragedy of losing her 16 year old brother, she has also recently lost um, a young cousin and a young brother, another young brother. And they were like school age kids. So this girl is in some pain. And I, mm -hmm. I'm quite sure that this was the last damn thing that she was gonna allow to happen to her and for her not to do anything about it yeah so uh, i'm quite sure you know we'll keep uh looking for some uh information further information about that story um as as things go along now this story out of new york is some crazy mess so this past week young woman walks into a bodega Guy approaches her, he wants to talk to her. She's like, nah, haha, no, thank you, blah, blah, blah. If you've seen part part of the video, it's like he's they're outside and he's got her by her arm and he's like taking her in a circle. Like she's trying to get away from him. He attacks her 
and tries to bite her eye out. Like he's biting her in her face. She's horribly injured at this point mm -hmm. because this man attacked her simply because she denied him herself. She denied his privilege and denied his access to herself, this unknown person, and he attacked her. Because of rejection. Rejection. This what this what y'all doing now? <laughs> is is this 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 what we gonna do? Listen, this I mean it's bad. You know what I was gonna say. You know what I ain't even gonna say that because I was gonna say something that's controversial and I ain't gonna do it. It's our show. But, yeah, this is the escalation of what they are. Y'all already lack a, a respect for black women as it is. How There's many guys lack you know, that you turn them down and they be like, "Well, that's why." I ain't, you know, all of a sudden you ugly and everything else. <laughs> But you, you already don't respect us, really. You know, you already put us at the bottom, you know, of, of the pole. You already put us at the bottom. And now, that's not even good enough to constantly degrade us, you know, yeah, uh, what type of we are. Complain about how we are, how we are mechanically made as, as beautiful, strong black women in this country. It's best bad, bad enough. So now, y'all trying to hurt us because we say we no. We are our own men. Not even for um, emotional or, or, you know, verbal abuse, but stranger abuse. Let me tell you what I think this is from. This generation, this, this new generation of young men and even young women, we are raising mediocre ass people who are honorable mention seekers sorry we do not want to tell our kids that no you cannot have no you do not have the best voice so you will not be trying out for america's uh, uh got talent don't do that you can't sing you can't draw you are not that fast you are not the best gymnast you can't throw a football not the best. right brandy fix your your mic it's a little muffled but we don't allow our kids to lose. We don't allow them to feel rejection. And rejection means that to feel rejection, and it hurts, trust me, because I hate rejection, but I don't attack people because I'm rejected. Right. You just move forward. That's, that's how you get gain calluses because if life is kind enough to you, you will have a, you will have a long life and you're going to face this several times. So, are you going to attack every person, every woman who tells you no? Do you know how many women who have got punched in the face because a man told her no or a drink thrown in her face? Um, as a single person, both of you guys are married, but as a single person right now, going out, being at a bar, being at a club, and somebody tries to dance with you, you'd be like, oh, it's kind of like you have to almost give in to it because you fear the reprisal of what they could do. Um, and it's a scary prospect. Um, I had that experience maybe two summers ago, and this guy came with a friend of mine, and I was like, eh, I don't really want to dance. And he's like, well, why are you here? To get drunk, sir. Like, I... <laughs> that's my purpose. I don't dance. Like, y'all know, I don't dance. I don't like to sweat on the dance floor. I did not put this makeup on and this dress and put this clone on to dance and sweat this out. I don't dance. But I finally just had to give in because he was so, so persistent. And I didn't know this guy. So I didn't know like what his level was. Like, is he gonna mm -hmm. be able to, you know, I don't know, like I, I grew up with brothers, so it could get real physical real quick, but you don't want to take it there. You know what I mean? You don't, cause you don't know right. what the person has. So um, yeah, I, I will try to find a video that I can post so you guys can see what her, what she looks like. Um, after the attack, and you only seeing a portion of her face, but you are seeing, you can see around her eye where the bite marks in her, the swollen part. And of right her above head. her eye and her forehead. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, quit raising entitled ass kids, y'all. And weak ass kids. Weak I told my kids. kids. Weakest generation we have had, had yet, yet. Y'all are so weak. They can't go out. They don't go outside. They don't have any They don't go outside. They don't 
That'd be nice. Just, uh, you know, in our neighborhood, our neighbors, they're, they're, her little her boys come outside and play. And when I tell you, it's a joy because all these kids on this street don't nobody come outside but her little boys. And I'd be like, don't nobody go outside no more. I used to love going outside. <laughs> No, just in the house because we want to right. with our kids and we don't want them to be hurt. Man, listen, when I was growing up as the only girl among a bunch of boys, I was not exempt um, <laughs> at all. You know, it was like, are you bleeding? No, then take your yeah, ass right. outside. Yeah. Is it yeah, broken? No. Yeah, right. Take your ass outside. And then you do the wiggle test. Can you move it? Yeah. You all right then? I don't know what that's saying. You know, yeah. I broke my arm in several places playing with my brothers. And because I was told not to play with them in the first place with the game that they were playing and I broke my arm in the commission of that game, I kept playing that game for hours with a broken arm, broken shoulder, broken wrist, broken, what is what? what is this? Oh, Jesus. Right and a broken shoulder on my right side. And I kept playing for hours until my aunt came home and was like, what's wrong with your arm? And I was like, nothing, nothing. I could have been walking around here like Quasimodo, y'all, because I refused <laughs> to go in the house. Like, that was the thing, like, you couldn't, like, if you cry, you had to go in the house. Nobody wants to go in the house. Nobody wants to be in the house. What is there to do in the house? That's punishment. That is so right. You cry, yeah. so crap. Be like, and, we had to work for everything. We had to do chores. You know, you got told no. Um, the coaches, if you were in high school and you didn't make the team, the coaches weren't trying to placate you and, and rub your back and say, well, you know, we're going to give you a position on our team. No, we want to win and you stuck. No, you can't play. How about you keep score? Sit down. Practice more. Sit down. You know, You'll be all right. Keep score. Be the ball boy. Whatever. Be, but hey, this is not this is not your wheelhouse. This is not your ministry. Go do something else. But we give honorable mentions to ever, all these kids. And so they feel entitled to everything. And so when someone tells them no, then it's seen as a personal attack. But this woman, this young woman was denying this man a part of herself, her time. I'm not interested at this time. Thank you so much. I must go. And she doesn't even have that right to tell someone no at this point. Um, there was a rally outside the bodega. There was lots of mm -hmm. people, hundreds and hundreds of people that showed up there. Um, from what I gathered, the uh, the guy who did this ran away. But, you know, the streets talk, so hopefully he'll be found uh, for um, for his safety. Was, was it both guys or was it just the, or was it just him? Was it him and his friend? Or was it just the one guy? I think it was the it was a friend, but I think it was the one guy who actually attacked her. Oh, okay. Who actually bit her. So yeah, um, you know they'll figure it out. I promise you they will. Yeah. So if you have daughters, um, buy them safety and protection gear. Um, I bought my daughter um, pepper spray. She she has a knife and all of those things. But I still you know just be hyper vigilant because people, um, yeah, we're not safe. No, we're not safe. So there's that. All right. So that's it with uh, Al Gore's internet. Now let's talk about crazy ass Richard Ramirez. Did he scare y'all? Yep. Good. Good. He did. Because now you know what to look for when somebody has soulless eyes. That is Richard Ramirez. Um, last uh, week yeah. we did. Watching a documentary, he definitely was scary to me. Yeah, last week we did Nico Jenkins, another soulless person. Um, and we brought him up because he was on TikTok. Uh, Richard Maris has long been on our list of people to profile and talk about, but because he's now back in the news with a new Netflix documentary, was it three, what, four or five episodes, limited six mm -hmm. episodes, we're, we decided to go ahead and push this forward and talk about him while everyone else is talking about him. Um, so Richard Ramirez, a serial killer, serial rapist, serial pedophile, a burglar, um, all around Olympic level criminal. Mm -hmm. Olympic level criminal. So we're going to talk about Richard Ramirez. Um, Olympic level. Now, if 
Are you familiar with Richard Ramirez? Yes, he's a serial killer, um, active uh, early, well, the mid 80s in Southern, well, actually all over California, starting in 1984, when the first documented um, murder or case involving him starts to happen. But um, I'm quite sure he was active before because the way that he committed his crimes was, wasn't was something that was spur of the moment. I mean, they were random, but I don't think that they were um, new. Um, no. but, so basically, Richard Ramirez is a Hispanic man from El Paso, Texas, born in 1960, has a real jacked up uh, childhood. Mm -hmm. Drops out of high school, uh, moves to California when he's 22, and that's when the trouble starts. So if you're not familiar with his story, just get familiar with it because we're really not going to go into all the details of his whole life. We're just going to talk about this documentary and how scary it was to be, um, if, if Brandy remembers, I definitely remember to be a citizen of Southern California during this time, even though I was very young, I remember the changes that we had to make because of the fear that we felt behind mm -hmm. the Night Stalker. So, um, the child you. yeah. So in 1984, he starts killing people. And uh, the first one that he has is uh, he kills a little girl, nine-year-old girl in San Francisco in yep. April of 1984. And the one thing about Richard Ramirez, his crimes, there is no clear path to what he's doing, why he's doing it. He has what they call the modus operandi. He doesn't have one. Uh, law enforcement doesn't know what to do with this guy. He's committing crimes, two crimes in a night, Sometimes he'll yep. go weeks and nothing, then he'll commit a murder, then it'll be a sexual assault, then he'll kidnap children from their schools. So he's all over the place. He has no particular demographic. He assaults male and female, sexually and um, mm -hmm. non-sexually. Um, murders male and female, every single race that he can get his hands on. Yeah, it didn't matter. Um, he's breaking into homes, he's stealing cars robbery he has no motive and the bad part of these crimes that he's committing is he's committing them mostly in los angeles county mm -hmm. um if you're not familiar with la la is humongous and every little city has its own police department so you have the lapd for the metropolitan area and even lapd has um substations or whatever then you have the sheriff's department, which is another powerful entity into itself. And then you have the smaller police departments. Well, everybody wants to have a pissing match on who right. is going to solve this crime. And they totally fuck this up. Yep, they do. So from um, uh, early summer 1984 to late summer 1985, Richard Ramirez wreaks havoc in um, Southern California and scares the be Jesus out of every yeah. single citizen. Um, so I don't know uh, if we should start just asking each other questions uh, about uh, the documentary. So Jackie, since you um, not a were not a citizen of Southern California, right? how much did you know about Richard Ramirez prior to watching this documentary or, you know, just prior to doing this, this type of thing that we're doing now? I did not know who he was. And it, and I was kind of sad about it because he's scary. He is so scary. And the things he did were disgusting. It was fa I'm like, I know about Bundy. And Bundy, in my opinion, Bundy is nowhere near <laughs> as sick. He's sick. Bundy is sick. He's sick. But... I think that he may, uh, Ramirez may be a little bit worse because while he's committing crimes and uh, raping and killing people, he is also uh, kidnapping children and molesting and raping them also. So just imagine he's doing everything at once. It's not like he's skipping a day. He's literally no, like kidnapping. I'm telling you, he's, go Olympic, he's like an Olympic decathlete. Uh, of 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 criminals like he he's hitting he's gold meddling out on every single thing um i think your comparison to his you're comparing him to to ted bundy is oh, sorry. ted bundy is a little bit easier to take in 
because when you look at Ted Bundy, you can see a li you can see that you would have a conversation with Ted Bundy. You'd sit down and have a drink with Ted Bundy because he's so very charismatic and you want to talk to him and he's very intelligent. So we see, we're trying to figure out how someone so handsome and yeah, educated can do this. So we, we're drawn into Ted Bundy because we want to try to figure out because when you look at him, you don't see a serial killer. Right. When you, you think that would have been crazy? Huh? He, what was crazy to me with Richard Ramirez is he going there and doing these horrible, bloody crimes, like, you know, just sick stuff. And then he in your refrigerator eating a honeydew. <laughs> Give him something to eat. Like, like, you know, the same way you would go from watching TV to going to get you a snack. Like, it was like it didn't phase him like he felt no remorse he wasn't sickened by what he did the, the gruesome scenes like he was just like well let me go on in here and cure these folks and then i'm gonna go over there and, and, and make me a sandwich or, or you know give me a piece of fruit right like, and he was that part the at the house with the bodies just dead two three hours right and that part is the scary part because when you have someone who can commit these crimes and then go make a sandwich as if there's nothing wrong, there's nothing to stop this person. So definition of a psychopath, and this is according to um, medical news today, and I just pulled this up on the interwebs. It's um, the, let's see, the term to describe individuals who display some personality, I don't wanna use that one. Um, lack of empathy and remorse and persistent antisocial behavior. Um, let's see what WebMD says because we all trust WebMD. Um, let's see what they say. Do, 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 do. So basically, um, they don't have any moral compass. You know, nope. like normal people say, you know, this is wrong. I shouldn't do this because this is going to affect, you know, um, a cert certain way. They just don't feel any killing a roach and killing a human to them is the same thing. Um, making that sandwich after you've got blood on you from bludgeoning someone is like splashing water on your face. Like it doesn't phase them at all. Um, and like I was saying, like a Ted Bundy, like even though he is a psychopath or was a psychopath, he's very um, relatable. Yes, he's relatable. Relatable and, in the sense that you could talk to him. He seems normal. He seems he like seems, a regular person. He's like he as normal person. as an apple pie. And, right. and I think that's because he's a white male also. So we're willing to try to figure out why this white male with these advantages is willing, it, it would do this. Whereas Richard Ramirez, Hispanic male, he's or a real other person of color he's committing a, a crime like this. We we already assume that they're sinister. Right. We, we assume that they're sinister. So we don't really try to figure out why they do what they do. We just assume that they did what they did because that's what they do. Well, the, um, the man was repulsive. He had bad teeth. He had horrible hygiene. The man said he smelled like a goat. I mean, he was just repulsive all around. He was. He was. Mm -hmm. He was largely transient. He moved to California when he was 22 um, from El Paso. Now, his life prior to moving to California started off with his father used to be like a police officer in like Cuidad uh, Juarez or something like that. Um, but he was also very abusive as well. Um, he had an uncle named Miguel that was in um, Vietnam and he was largely influenced by this uncle. So they would tell him about like the things that they would do to, you know, the women and stuff that they would capture in Vietnam and how they would torture and kill them and rape them. Mm -hmm. he's, he's soaking all this up and he has this abusive father. And um, then Miguel kills his wife, shoots his wife in the face in front of Richard. Um, when he's around maybe 13, 14, he starts to do drugs like LSD, which literally fries your brain. So literally, if he had any um, usable um, brain cells left that, that led to any sort of, sort of empathy, they're probably fried up during that time. Um, 
he starts to, and of course, this is the time where young men start to develop a sense of sexuality, what they like, what they don't like. And his sexuality now is tied to violence. Um, mm -hmm. He did attempt to rape um, a lady staying at a hotel that he was working at in El Paso. Uh, her husband found them and he beat the dog mess out of Richard, but they dropped the charges because they were out of state and they refused to come back to Texas to testify. So that was, you know, really the first documented time that he had actually, you know, committed, you know, a crime like that. So at that point you have to ask, was it in his nature to be this way? And then the people in his life and in the events that happened in his life nurtured that? And could he have been different if because you know being a psychopath doesn't necessarily mean you're being a murderer because there's lots of psychopaths out there um but he, could he have just been one of those psychopaths who just don't care if the the events in his life hadn't changed like the, his father hadn't been abusive or his uncle hadn't been an asshole and told him all the stuff um could he have been different was this is this a nature versus nurture thing what do you what do you guys think do you think he's in, do you think that he is inherently evil? Like from because because of, because of the what up. his environment was. You know how I feel. I feel that we once we become a, adults, then we have the opportunity to rewrite our lives. So you don't have to okay. This could have sound so bad. Okay. In order to sit there and literally continuously molest a child and you know you wrong you know that's wrong you know they're going to be damaged you know it's going to hurt their feelings and you to be okay with that I don't think that's a he was brought up by violence but what, what, where did that come from then Cause that's a, but when you are a psychopath the fact that this is going to hurt this person doesn't matter the fact that this is a child doesn't matter. So all those factors that you just put out there really don't matter. They don't you care about your gratification. Right. This pin has his, you know, if he crushes his pin, that means the same amount as if I crush someone's spirit or crushes someone's soul. So it doesn't, there is no here and here. There is no moral compass. There is no sense of right or wrong. Like I, to a psychopath, it's like, I know society tells me that's wrong, but I don't feel it. So Randy, I think he could have, uh-uh. It's true. It's true. I, was black. I know that society is. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying uh, in regards to him. Uh -huh. I, uh uh. I think he, uh uh. I, maybe for a little while. But I don't know. I, see, I don't when know. He was young, that's when he started this, this, the this, 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 this Satanism and uh, all of those things. I don't like it. That's too much on my brain. <laughs> We are talking about one of the most infamous killers in the world. In the world. Oh, that's a good quote. Oh, you made me look at it different. Yes. You remember when the lady was talking about how that he had molested her and he kept saying that he was sorry, mm -hmm. but he still kept doing it. Mm -hmm. He knew it was wrong. Like, is, when, why is he sorry? What was he sorry for? Only because he probably knew it was wrong, but then he, he had this impulse do it anyway so do you really think that he was a true merciless psychopath with no feelings based on just that incident of him saying I'm sorry um, but continuing to assault her do you think that he was truly soulless or like we talked about narcissists last week like narcissists mm -hmm. they really with Nico Jenkins like they really they really want the attention I don't think that the, the Richard Ramirez wanted the attention. Um, and you also have to look at just, did he get any kind of, it just he's just raggedy, he had a, a yuck mouth, he was stanky and musty. What woman you think that, I mean, he couldn't just walk up to a woman and strike up a conversation and be like, let's go out and date normally and all this stuff. He seemed kind of reclusive that he probably didn't have people skills. He didn't. He did So, <clears throat> So, uh, I mean, and, and his, 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 you know, his, his cousin, his older cousin, you know, when he was in his formative years and they're talking about rape and violence associated with that, just think about what that does to a young, young man's brain. 
um, talking about those things. And so now you're associating these feelings, these physical feelings, man, because you know, when you're young, you can't have the wind blows and you're aroused, but now you are aroused by these stories of violence and right. you know, sexuality, sex and violence are just two sides of the same coin, you know, because it's all about excitement. And so this excites me and um you your 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 energy your 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 energy changes when i mean just think about when you watch a a movie and someone's getting killed you you, you get hyped and you get excited that is kind of a mirror to what happens when you see a girl mm-hmm. or you see a boy you get hyped and you get excited so now you you've associated this thing with this this other part so that's when he starts to um starts raping women or starts wanting to assault them and so all of his sense of sexuality is tied to violence because right. of his uncle or cut older cousin telling him about this stuff. And uh, he did withdraw like from school and his friends and everything when he was younger. So now he's by himself. So he's in his head. Yeah, so lot. he didn't have any more more interactions with people. Right, right. So his thing is like we're talking about. Playing environmental uh, behavior, definitely. Right. So just like we were um, talking about in with the with the with the uh, guy who bit the girl's face in New York, uh, I don't know how to take rejection. So I'm not even gonna do it. I'm not even gonna risk rejection. I'm just going to take it. Take it, yeah. I'm just going to take it because I know that if I take it, the, I'm not giving you a chance to interact. I'm not giving you a chance to rebut anything that I have to say. I don't have to be charismatic. I don't have to be cute. I don't have to have my hygiene together because it's all about me. I'm going. And he did receive sexual gratification when he was uh, raping people. So normally, rapists. What the scientists say is that rapists is not about arousal. But for him, was it the rape or was it the killing? It was the that rape. was arousing. I think it was the rapes. I think it was it, it was both. Hmm. Because remember, because remember the one house where he uh, went in there and he regurgitated in the kitchen, and then he was jacking off and and ejaculated on the carpet. The people was dead. The, right. the bodies were, were dead. But did he rape those people? I can't. It was a husband and a wife. Let me see. I can't remember, but I'm <laughs> like. Well, he didn't ejaculate in there with the. I mean, how many times did he ejaculate in there with the wife and on the carpet? I mean, it's possible. He's a, he was a young man, but there was also an incident where he was interrupted. His 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 assault, his sexual assault, was interrupted with one lady. He goes a couple of blocks to the next city in the same night. Yeah, and attacks and rapes another older woman. So yep. because his, his sexual gratification, he did not receive his sexual gratification. So you might be right, Randy, that, that, that those two things are tied to each other, that when I'm killing, I get aroused. Now I'm going to rape or I'm going to rape and then I'm going to kill. But both of, some, the, both of these things have to happen. Both of these have to happen. Because that and, woman fought back, so he didn't get to mm-hmm. finish whatever he had planned. Um, there was a case where, um, let's see, there was the the... Well, quick question. And the wife and well, the y'all both are from Cali. Mm-hmm. So y'all are familiar with this. Well, how how was it during that time? Like how did things how did y'all have to change your lifestyle? I know your parents had to do something to make things a little bit different to where you've noticed that there's a little bit slight change on how mama behaves when it comes to this, you know, in regards to safety. Because y'all were there. Y'all, yeah. y'all were there. So the cat. Uh, I was, I think, seven or eight. I want to say seven or eight years at the time. And 84, 85. And I just remember, we didn't lock our doors. No one locked their doors. This was still a time. Even though Southern California, California is was like serial killer capital. From like and this, yeah, this is on the hill of the hills, hillside like str- strangler. So this, this happened, the hillside strangler was the same cops mm-hmm. that worked those cases worked this one. So yeah. we still weren't locking the doors and the Hillside Strangler actually murdered someone in Riverside, a couple of miles away from my grandparents' house. Um, mm-hmm. So that was scary, but I don't think it was as scary as this one because those were targeted. Those had a, a, a specific mm-hmm. demographic, young white collegiate girls, you know, and some prostitutes. Richard Ramirez was killing everybody. He was going in windows. 
he was uh, 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 carjacking people and killing them there and, and all of these things. So you had this unknown person until they put that um, sketch out. And let's talk about sketches in a minute because those sketches were stupid because Jackie- The champ. <laughs> Um, you re he was like, he was really the boogeyman. Um, mm -hmm. and now we're locking doors and we can't go outside after dark. Even in our yard, we couldn't be outside after dark. Um, you have to walk someone to the car. You know, it, it was, it was scary. It really changed. I think when a crime happens like this, it really changes the, the, the community sense of innocence because now everyone's a suspect. Um, you don't feel safe in your own home. You don't feel safe around the people that you used to feel safe with. So it really changed how how we operated. So now everyone's always on edge. And I think Richard Ramirez really put that fear into Southern California because you did not know what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. And I felt that at eight years old, you know, and I just knew that from that time until now that Richard Ramirez, um, was the boogeyman and i still think that <laughs> i still think he's the boogeyman, you know um but that saying is more fitting right and so i i really think that he changed that for for southern california because we couldn't um again like you know the hillside strangler was right before this but that was just something you saw on the news something you could talk about you know because you knew at least in my family he wasn't gonna attack us, you know. <laughs> but Richard Ramirez was attacking us. There was he was attacking everybody. He was kidnapping kids uh, from literally from the schoolyard, and so you know everyone is on high alert at schools at wherever, and so that really that really changed um, changed. I don't think there's been a criminal like um, that's put the fear in us like uh, Richard Ramirez has. has. No, I don't think so either. Mm -mm. I don't think he has. I mean, I'm not from Cali, obviously, but there, I have yet to see anybody that, that put that to make me like, dang. I was here about this with my mom, and she was saying that she remembers a time when she said she's like, I don't remember who it was. She's like, but daddy worked at Kaiser Steel in Fontana, California. She said, and whatever was going on during that time, she said, we all went to work with him every single night. And I was like, y'all slept in the car? Y'all stayed in the car? She said, no, we slept in the car. So when my grandfather went to work at night, he put his six kids and his wife in the station wagon, took them to Kaiser Steel, parked the car in the parking lot, and they stayed in the parking lot until he got off work. And we kind of figured it out. We had to narrow it down. And I think that was when Charles Manson and the Manson family were active. Um, Cause you know, we just kind of do it by process, process of elimination with my youngest uncle being, hadn't been in school yet. So um, just imagine the Manson family out and this, this, this black man from Alabama who grew up in Jim Crow, mm -hmm. now living in California, he puts his entire family in the car and takes them to work with him. How scary that would be. Yeah. Um, and that's the same thing that the cop did um, when he took his family to Pomona because mm -hmm. Richard Ramirez had entered the, the home of another officer. Mm -hmm. And then also he, he, he uh, uh, sexually assaulted and stabbed the neighbor of the criminalist working on the case. As so, well as one of a childhood, one of his childhood Da childhood Maria. friend daughter he was one of the Maria was one of the that was first perhaps people. getting close like it was right. just... she was one of the first people um assaulted that was when her friend was being assaulted and her roommate or whatever and he shot both of them basically um and he come to find out that she's the daughter of his one of his childhood friends so uh things like this like you don't realize how close you are to people involved in these cases uh randy and i were talking about that earlier is that um how richard entered the house of one cop and had him scared um the other cop says he sleeps with a gun now mm -hmm. and then he assaults the neighbor of criminalist on the case 
So the question that she asked was, was Richard aware of who was working that case and did he do that deliberately? Mm. You think you think they were because he knew who was working the case that he you think he did? Or was it coincidence? Like he was baiting them? I don't I How can that be a coincidence? Yeah, I think it's a coincidence. It's too much. Then he's at the lead detective's house and the the uh the criminalist scene investigator's house. I, okay, so during the eighties, this is before all the privacy laws and you know and blocking people's numbers. All you had to do was pick up a telephone book, and your address was in the telephone book. You could call the hospital and get someone's information. You could call someone's job and get their information. And so it wasn't a secret on who's working the case like it is now. They were, they won't reveal the name of the detectives or the criminalists or whatever when you watch the news. These people were all over the news. So all he would have had to do was go to a Pacific Bell phone booth. And that's when they had the, t- the telephone books that used to hang from the string. I don't know, y'all. <laughs> y'all don't want to reveal your age and tell this. But they used to have the telephone book. On the phone booth, yeah. The phone booth and, and the, the telephone book would hang and you put it up on the shelf and you look. Mm-hmm. That's all he would have had to do to find out where she lived. And I think with the criminalist, the reason why he didn't assault her is because she had company that night. Did he do those on the same night? The chair, I mean, the detective's house and then Maria's house? Or Maria, was first. Maria was first. Maria was one of the first ones. But the criminalist no, house. No, I'm talking about the criminalist. Okay, the criminalist. He did that wasn't the same night, but he did commit another crime that night. Mm-hmm. That night, so he he went to her. I believe, and I, this is speculation. I believe he went there to do something to her, but she had company, and so he picked the next best thing, which was her neighbor. And then when he left the neighbor's house. He went to the neighboring city and committed another crime, and he killed an older woman there. Um, yeah, I, I think that he was he was baiting them. I don't think that was just that's just too random. That, that was, I mean, that, that was on um, that was Joyce Nelson, I believe, on July seventh, nineteen eighty five, and then he assaulted Zoe um, Sophie Digman. I'm just gonna go through the crimes on the timeline of what mm-hmm. how he does this okay so i'm not gonna go through all of them but the ones that closely match so march 17th of 1985 this is maria hernandez um dale yoshi okazaki in rosemead also march 17th a uh, sai leon Yu in monterey park this is the one that he pulled out of the car and shot her in the face so mm-hmm. this is the same night and then we go to um July 2nd, 1985, Mary Louise Cannon in Arcadia. July 5th, Whitney Bennett in Sierra Madre. July 7th, Whitney, uh, excuse me, July 7th was Joyce Nelson and then also Sophie Dickman, both of Monterey Park, both on the same night. We're going to jump down to um, August 6th, Chris and Virginia Peterson, and then... um, on August 8th, 1985, Sakina and Elias Abawa and their three-year-old son. And then on the 24th of August, he attacks the family of James Romero of Mission Viejo and then also Ben Carnes and Inez uh, Erickson of Mission Viejo. So this man, those are just some of the crimes. I didn't even go through all of them. But nope. he, he, it's like he's not receiving full satisfaction at one. So he goes and does it again. And it's, it, I think it's about his level of satisfaction at a particular crime. Um, I think that's why he's so random with what he does is he just has to do something. It's not whether it's murder, rape, or burglary. It's, he, 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 it's something. The burglaries and the robberies, I think, are secondary because he's already in the house. So it's, I might as well take some stuff if there is some stuff. Mm-hmm. But the, the actual crime itself, the violence, I think that is just opportunity you will have time to commit this rape am i compelled am i uh compelled to commit a rape or a murder and yeah or both you know what is his level what what kind of satisfaction uh does he need um what is 
what what is one of the most surprising things that you found out in this documentary about Richard Rare? Um, for me, it was the story. I'm not gonna say what was in it, and maybe I have it written down. I don't know about them. Um, most of the husbands, I noticed that one of the patterns that I noticed is he shot the husbands and they sleep immediately. That's like literally the first thing he did. Um, but where is it? Oh, the one where he was getting ready to, uh, he raped and beat her. And then he hung her by, uh, by the, oh, the 16 year old, Whitney. Hung her by the, he was trying to hang her by the cord. But he said the phone cord sparked and he believed that was God's way of telling him, do not kill her or t pretty much giving her a pardon to still live. So he left and I was like, now not nan time has that even been any kind of conversation? N not n he's raped, he's beat these women, they have begged him, he has made them swear on Satan, he has did all that, but this one particular, one particular issue a spark, even when he used the cords and they broke and all that stuff. But this one issue, he said it was God saving her. That one. So not the one that, that, that was a part of some religious like epiphany or was that just yeah. the opposite of part of his Satanism and believing in Satanism? A part of his Satanism. Yeah. Really? I just thought it was because I'm Great like, question. most of these women begged you. They they did what? I mean, some of you had some incident incidents where you almost didn't get away, all that, and yet this a phone spark, and you like, no, that's God saving. I'm not gonna do nothing else. Because I mean, I mean, there was nothing that it's actually happened to prevent him from doing any of this stuff before. Right. Um, there was the 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 elderly couple in the documentary. The granddaughter talks about her, her grandmother. She they would warn her grandmother um, mm -hmm. about locking her doors. And she's like, I'm not gonna do that. I'm from the Midwest where I'm just not gonna do it. There was nothing to prevent this man from doing what he did. Um, it's, it's because again, no one locked the doors at the time. I mean, it, it wasn't a big thing. Um, he got into the cop's house with a window that was painted shut. So it was kind of like this dude is a real phantom. So it was like, how do you stop him? Um, Brandy, did you find out anything uh, that you didn't know about Richard Ramirez before watching this? He was very sloppy with his crimes. Like, he <laughs> left evidence behind footprints. I mean, it may not have been no fingerprints, but... He did leave fingerprints at, at, at several crimes. But I'm like, you just you just sloppy. And if he had been, you know, if DNA had come along, he would have been caught long time but he got footprints he's leaving stuff behind he's leaving the shells behind like he just i mean just a sloppy crime and coincidentally the one thing that tied him to all these crimes was his footprint and his shoe there was yeah, one year he was so random of size he 11 11 and a half eight what 11 11 and a half avia what uh i'm via tennis yeah. shoes that he wore to every single crime until Diane Feinstein with her loud ass mouth. Okay. Uh, let the, the cat out of the bag with that one, even after the police departments were like, do not reveal this information. Don't do that. Um, I mean, if he had any kind of pattern, he would have been caught. But because he was just so everywhere that um, they just didn't connect the crimes. But he left all kind of, I mean, just left, just a, a sloppy. Crime. I need the, another reason why they didn't connect this stuff is because, like a, we like we mentioned before, every police department had a pissing match, and the sheriff's department and LAPD uh, wanted to solve this. But I don't even think they wanted to solve it. I just think they just wanted to close it. Um, they wanted the criminal to literally walk into the police department and say, "It's me. I'm the night stalker. I'm the guy." Because you have police, Frank Salerno, and um, why do I not know this man's name? And he's very integral to the story. Um, and the rookie cop, he's trying to tell them that's the guy. This is the same guy. And everyone, he's, they're literally laughing at him 
at every single police department that he goes to they are literally laughing at him thinking he's trying to make a man for himself but he's like no this is the guy what's his name gil gil yes gilbert uh the, he's like this is the guy look at this look at this look at the shoe print look at this look at this but they're like no when he attempted the kidnapping of the teenage girl and he got stopped he was in a stolen car and he ran and they yep. went to lapd when they picked that car up they went to lapd and said hey can we have this car lapd says no they're like can you just run can you process the car they do not process that car they ruined evidence that was that was available. Who they was find the the um the 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 appointment card for the dentist. They miss Richard going to the dentist by five days. Then they stake out the dental office in Chinatown. LAPD tells them, "Hey, stop! You're wasting your time. You're wasting our money. We'll just put a robbery on this, and we'll have an alarm set." Then they didn't do the damn alarm correctly. Nope. The, the dentist calls back and it's like, he was here. Why were he here? Where we up? He literally walked in the day that you guys stopped. He walks in our office. So there was ample opportunity for the police to have caught Richard Mears long before he did. But LAPD botched this so much. And it's crazy because you have to think about this is a very high profile case where they botched it. Mm -hmm. If you think about all the people who are no name criminals who don't have names that were railroaded into confessions and into convictions because LAPD were too fucking lazy to do their jobs and their murder squad was too busy to do their jobs and they ignored evidence. That, the detective? Right. And they create a story. Oh my God. And they, they like, it's going to fit the story. They don't want to do any work. They just want the, the crime to fit the story. Um, so they had the media, they had the, that what was that lady's name? I said, oh, she a beast. Oh, the, she, the reporter. Yes. Yeah, they had to make, she was negotiating all kind of stuff like, you don't want me to tell this? This is what I need. Yeah. Tell me. And I what remember you? her being on TV when I was younger. I remember her. Um, I think her name was Diane. But, yeah. Um, I, I remember was. her being on TV when I was younger, but she was definitely... Uh, a serious journalist um, during those years. But I think they could have caught him a long time before he was actually caught because like Brandy said, he left breadcrumbs everywhere. 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 You know, everything was right there. It was like he was, he was careless. And I think a part of him being careless was like, he doesn't care if he gets caught. And you know, one of the comments that he made, and I'm paraphrasing, um, when he was given the death penalty, with 19 death sentences, it was like death is going to come to everybody. So, so no that's pretty much what he said. Like, it, so what? I mean, this isn't anything. No, it's, it's whatever. Um, all right, before we before we end, we're going to talk about the trial and the sentencing. Um, Jackie, one of the things that you asked me was. What was our impression? What did we feel about Richard Ramirez when this was happening? Um, during the trial is when most of us got to know who Richard Ramirez was. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things and one, one of the most memorable things about Richard Ramirez is when he did like this and he had the pentagram on his hand and mm -hmm. he looked directly at the camera. And so he did the same thing that Nico Jenkins did and a lot of other criminals do. They look and they play to the media, they play to the camera. And right. he, you know, by that time he got his teeth fixed and all of a sudden he goes from Quasimodo to GQ model, fine. And all these- That's movies, a matter of opinion. Well, I'm just saying, I'm not saying, you know, that I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna be, I was gonna be right or nothing, but I'm just saying his, his attractiveness grew exponentially once he got- It did. Like the picture that it, I the picture that I posted, it the did. That I posted. He was it's, modified. It's like his, I don't care what you say. Like where he even when he he changed his wardrobe, he, he was no longer the scary demon. Now he's the handsome demon. Like who? Ted Bundy. Yep. I, I remember thinking that like, oh, he came in with the swag like, and that's why I put those two pictures together so you could see the difference between. 
what he looked like at an arraignment and then what he looked like during trial because now he's got his teeth fixed and yep <laughs> now you can understand why the women were clamoring to get to him why he got married while he was incarcerated and why he was one of the most popular pimp houses because women are now attracted to this same thing happened with ted bundy he had a whole, he had a whole fan club and charles manson and charles manson you know mm -hmm. even chris watts chris watts yes you know, this, it, you know, hairline Chris Watts, women are like, but he's so handsome. And I want this man is Ooh. a murderer. Killing oh. your wife and your kids is handsome. But it doesn't, but but here's the thing, Brandy. Our eyes and our psyche are two different entities. So we we you and I are thinking that what he has done makes this man unattractive. But at face value, Chris Watts. People are looking at him as attractive. At face value. Ted Bundy would have been considered a handsome man. At face value, Richard Ramirez in some of those pictures was, wow. If you did not know what they done. But they did know, know what they did. But I'm just saying. But there are some people who are attracted to that. Like some people are attracted to pastors. We don't know why people want to be a pastor's wife. But they're attracted to the image. They're attracted to the aura, the energy. And some people are attracted to negative energy. And hmm. or the, or the idea that they both relate to the same thing. Uh -huh. They just as sick as they are, in my opinion. Satanism is a big deal. It's a Absolutely. big, big deal. Absolutely. And some of those women were attracted to that, and some of them, I'm sorry, I thought when he came in, like, what? I swear. I mean, okay, okay. let's talk about Jeremy okay. Meeks, Prison Bay. Get that link. The, no, the original Prison Bay. Jeremy Meeks. But was he killing it in, in blood? It doesn't matter. And Jeremy Meeks was a convicted criminal. And we went absolutely ape, ape shit over Jeremy Meeks. He's a criminal. So it, the, the crime doesn't mean he's a, he's a convict. This mm -hmm. man has committed crimes. But we're like, damn, he's fine. Like, let me bail his ass out. Like, what what we need to do? Didn't even you know, went too far right there. What happened? You're gonna put a soup on your book you know but see we're just thinking of it like jeremy meeks like you said he wasn't a violent criminal he didn't murder anybody but he's still fine and right. you know and he married a billionaire he married an actual billionaire and yes he did <laughs> he secured the bag y'all he secured yes, the bag. He did. left that wife and kid heartbeat Gone, you know. I mean, think about Tupac Shakur. He was a convicted rapist. Now, did he rape her? We don't. We don't know. We don't think so. But he's convicted of that crime. Well, yeah. it. That's still Tupac Shakur. That's still bad. That's still still bad. Legendary bad. <laughs> legendary bad. But he's a convicted rapist. So that part, like, we can we can always pick and choose who we want to. Uh, um, vilify. Well, I guess or, I ain't seen uh, fine serial killers, so because you're thinking about that they're a serial killer first, and then their looks secondary. Like I mean, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of first. It's a freaking serial killer. Yep, gross serial killer. I don't care how fine you are when it's pitch black outside and you peeping through my window, but you won't know that because there are. I mean, they're already. You know, because there was a while comment I'm about my, while I'm in my gown and my head rack. Because you better be raped and pillaged in your gown and head rack. Um, mm -hmm. There was a comment on my personal page about Nico Jenkins. Like, yeah. You saw that? Yeah. You saw that? Like, damn, I was like, I mean, like, had you met this dude? She was serious. Yes. But I'm just saying, because we grew up in a certain culture where, where um, you had that sort of criminal swag. And if you grow up in an urban culture, in an urban neighborhood, you're used to dudes who look rough, and you know that they've, they've dropped a few bodies, but, eh, you know? And the reality is the girls like bad boys. Right. And when you That's think about it, so it's I cliche. Think I've said before is that a gang member who has a lot of bodies under his belt is a serial killer. Mm -hmm. But we assign it differently. We, we categorize that differently. We're willing to accept that gang member for all his bodies, but we're not willing to accept 
a Richard Ramirez or a Ted Bundy or a Nico Jenkins. You got a point there. You know, and I know a lot of fine gang related serial killers. And they still fine. I don't give a damn how many you got. I don't want to mess with you. I don't want to talk with you. But I'm going to admire from afar. <laughs> like, yeah, he's still fine. He's crazy, but he's fine. So, you know, that's part of the mystique of the serial killer culture. Um, you know, uh, serial killers are very popular subjects. People want mementos from They are. Uh, you think about John Wayne Gacy. He used to sell his paintings. Um, John Wayne Gacy's paintings are still very popular and very profitable. The ones that he wow. was in prison. And this man killed, what, 40 some young men? Mm-hmm. Put them under his house? Um, items belonging to Ed Gein, um, who was the was the uh, the um, the factual idea behind the movie Psycho, and also um, Silence of the Lamb. Um, people wanted pieces of his home. Uh, they wanted to talk to him. Brandy, do you remember? Um, I want to. I'm going to say his first name, and maybe you'll get who his last name. And you remember Brandy from Mission in uh, high school? Yes. Okay. Very fascinated with Ed Gein. I didn't know who Ed Gein was until I started hanging around with Brandon and Zach. You remember Zach too, right? So mm-hmm. Brandon was emo before emo was a thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, he was emo before that was even a term. But he was fascinated with serial killers. That's probably where I got fascinated with. Him. But he would talk about Ed Gein. And then I started to kind of try to find out who this was. And when I say fascinated, I'm talking about a completely obsessed with mm. in the culture and serial killer culture. So it is actually a thing where people are attracted to serial killers, want to marry them. Charles Manson got married while he was in prison. Richard mm-hmm. Manson got married while he was in prison. Uh, Ted Bundy was married prior to going with, to prison and got his girlfriend like pregnant or whatever so it's a thing that women are women and men are attracted to serial killers and serial criminals um as if there's some sort of i don't know if it's a power thing or like i'm fascinated but i don't i don't i don't i'm not gonna be going down there you know we've suspended our prison ministry here at black coffee and crime <laughs> uh, <laughs> And there's, you know, <laughs> and, you know, not that any of us are trying to get down to the county or nothing, but um, that's not what we're doing. You know, we, we, we're not doing that. It's, it, as much as nosy as we are and as much as we are, <laughs> we're not trying to go down there. We're not trying to put money in your books. Um, wait, wait, what we suspended to? Tell you, we got what we are six months. It's in the death. Yeah. It is Sorry. definite. We ain't going down there. We ain't going. <laughs> we ain't going. Sorry, y'all. Y'all ain't gonna get me caught up with no uh yoked up uh prison dude with a good game and you know have my credit bad and you know get out using my car and stuff. The money books. Yeah, because that's you know that's the first thing they gonna do. Let me use your car to go around my mama house. No. No. That's the first thing they do. They need to ride. They need to ride. And listen, a cautionary tale to every woman out there who thinks that dating a man. Okay, I have a story about dating this guy who was recently released from prison. Oh. And then we're going to end this. It is a funny story, but slightly scary story. So he tells me I was at work and, you know, I'm like, eh. he tells me, you know, like he keeps coming in the store and I was like, hey. So finally he tells me he wants to talk to me or whatever. He told me a situation. I was like, mm, okay. You know, I asked him, what'd you go in there for? It wasn't a violent crime. I was like, all right. Please. You know, and then of course I'm knowing you've been in there for a minute. It's about to go down, right? Mm-hmm. And it did. And I'm giving away too much information. But listen. They crazy as fuck, y'all. Um, dude would call at three o'clock in the morning and be like, "You didn't call me. I'm sleeping." Oh, 
I don't know if I'm still asleep. You said you were gonna call me, but I'm asleep though. I want to talk to you. Why are you like you? Why? Um, so finally, I mean, it just got to be to where it was just like two possessive dudes. Was just, it was just crazy. Uh, and I'm at my store. And Brandy, you've heard the story. Yes. I'm at my store, and they had this big picture window in the store. And there's this guy in this Cadillac bro hand, this, the, the big ass Cadillac, y'all. Mm -hmm. And he's going up and down the parking lot. Uh, 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 uh. So my he walked in? No, in the car, Jackie. In the car. Just back and forth. And this this happened a couple of times. So one day he calls me, he was like, where are you being? Now I'm at work. He's like, uh -huh. I was like, at work? I'm here now. He's like, no, you left, where'd you go? What? 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 Are you, what? What? He's like, who are you with? And I was like, I don't understand what you're talking about. What, what were you talking about? He's like, you left. And I said, like, yeah, but I was at work. You haven't been at work all day. What happened was I went to a meeting in another city and two salesmen went with me. And when we went to lunch and when I got out of the car, one of the sales guys opened my car door. He knew all of that because he was sitting in the parking lot. So because I was like, I'm at work, he was like thinking I was lying. But to me, I was at a meeting, so I was at work. So anyway, right. time goes by and he's still, I don't know that it's him in this big ass black bro going out of the <laughs> So this particular day, the manager of the store, the same guy that I went to lunch with that day stands out and he's like, who is this in this Cadillac? So we all rushed to the front of the door, the front of the store. He was like, he's looking for somebody. Whoever, whoever he's looking for is in trouble. So I look. <laughs> Tim. It's my own personal prison bag. Oh, man. So I call him and I'm like, what are you doing? Because I don't want nobody to know. What are you doing? And he was like, I just want to see you. And I was like, yeah, I'm calling you from the store. Like, leave right now. So my manager hears me talking to him. Girl. I had a whole ass stalker and a Cadillac Rohan going up and down the parking lot to make sure that I was out. All because I wanted prison day. So let this be a cautionary tale. Ask your question, Jackie, because I know you got questions. Go ahead and ask your questions. Come on, come on. Come on. What so, question? Did he know you? Didn't he know you had a job that you work? <laughs> that you have, <laughs> that you have things to do. <laughs> that you he did to because do. he met no, at my job. His purpose to see if he was gonna catch some, like yes, yes, because obviously there were too many men working in my store, and um, but that wasn't even your man though. Wasn't my man. But we were going, you know, like we would go to lunch, you know, one, I buy lunch one day, you buy lunch the other day. Well, Wait, well, well, where did you meet him? In the store. <laughs> <laughs> he already know I go down in there. Yes, in the store, in the store. But I was like, you know, he's cool because it wasn't a violent crime. You know, like you're telling me your situation, blah, blah, blah. So everything is everything. I did not know that the little prison man was a whole ass girl thing. i don't i don't ask her every question there is to ask about this here scenario <laughs> <laughs> i'm saying her still like perplexed like i don't get it like he know you working you know you go you know what i'm doing you know what i'm doing yes why are you stalking me it got so bad that i would not even drive myself to work first of all where did you get that bro hand man let's talk about that <laughs> you keep driving up and down here Embarrassed me because you do it the most. Because got out of his mama's driveway. I don't know where he got that car from because when I met him, he had no car because he'd only been out a few days. So and he got, thinking, out, got him a car. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, he's only been out a few days. It's fresh too. Yeah, it's about to be on. But let me tell you, ladies. It, it was on, not, all right. Yes, it is not worth it. It is too expensive. Okay. Prison <laughs> may be, it's too expensive. Because you don't know, even though it was a nonviolent crime, 
you don't know if they've committed a violent crime before that. And the crazy is here. This was not my thing. This was just the prison bag hookup. He was a crazy psychopath. Crazy psychopath. Crazy Why is you crazy. driving up? Wait a minute. Next, wait, wait, real quick. <laughs> How long was he doing this? <laughs> like driving for a day? <laughs> if we could put this in the app. How many hours was he just literally doing this? A couple. More than one. It was like all morning because we kept noticing the car. And you talking the day, mess the whole time and the whole time it was your The whole boy. time it was, it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> she I noticed the car before, but I was like, you know, whatever. You know, we, I, we worked in the hood store. The store was off of Camp Wisdom in 67. So you know exactly where I'm talking about, okay? Jack, you know what I'm talking about. Camp Wisdom 67. <laughs> So, oh, so <laughs> that's why you banned him because he was. <laughs> Yo, that's the hood, man. It's the hood. <laughs> and y'all, at okay, look, I have to give a caveat. At this time, I had not been in Texas that long, so I wasn't aware that the hood is way different. Uh, was it my rapper? <laughs> You know where the shell station is? Across from <laughs> Oh man, that's why okay, go ahead. <laughs> in that parking lot of the shell station, right at Camp Wisdom in 67. <laughs> going from one end all the way down to um, you know where Burlington and Sears is, and turn around. You know where Roham is that car is about seven feet, seven, eight feet long. Oh, so I would have killed for the moment. <laughs> killed. So he's doing this. I noticed the car in the parking lot for a few, you know, for more than a few days. But I'm not, you know, whatever. But that particular day, he was what? Going to and I was like, it wasn't one day. No, this was a common thing. Yes, but I. It wasn't like he was going up and down. Oh. But I would notice that car outside. But I really wasn't paying attention because it was a bro hand with tinted windows. So I don't oh. know who's in this car. <laughs> Hold. Whole time is your <laughs> right. I didn't know he was in that car. So that yeah. day, they're like, "Who is in this car?" And I was like, "I don't know," but whoever in that car is mad as fuck, and <laughs> somebody's about to get it. Whole time it was me. <laughs> it hurt right here from laughing because I'm just, I'm just. I'm just Bring down the answer to the questions. I ain't got to ask no more. But I'm just... You can picture it in your mind. That's what the problem is. That's the problem. I'm like... What? I know what a boy looks like. That's a chunky piece of car to be going through this. <laughs> he was using that car like it was a he, thoroughfare. He was using that car like, like it was a thoroughfare. Was, whoa. And you know he was turning that wheel with one hand. Yes. <laughs> Brandy, Brandy, that's the. I thought it was gonna be okay. You know, <laughs> hello, hello boo, you said that there. You know, she real classy and real. And there she the guy principal who is, is, is stalking her. In that space, I can see her like, what is wrong with him? I'm thinking that he's going to abide by the rules. And the rules were, oh. this is just a hookup and that's it. Why are you calling me? Like, we're not friends. We don't, I'm, you know, like, I don't, I can't support you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, and get this, girl. He was like Lord Farquaad, okay? So, doing all this. <laughs> He was shorter than you. Bro, he was Lord Farquaad. Um, and you imagine this person getting out this uh this bro ham with some with Lord Farquaad with cornrows. Okay? He was driving a bro ham. Oh gosh. Oh, with the prison uh, cornrows. This conversation don't went a whole other. Well, see, this is a teachable moment, Brandy. Because I'm talking about prison babes. This is te- this is a teachable moment. And you know this is a story of my life because you know I be, right. I be getting myself into some bullshit, right? I, I just did not say it. I'm sorry. And and that the, that's not the only prison bay, y'all. 
I, you would think I would have learned my lesson with this dude. He still. Listen, prison bears have their place, but you gotta know how to finesse it. That's why we're not going back. Don't Just let go. them know where you live, and don't let them know where you work. Okay. Never. <laughs> and, if you, and if you're in New Orleans, and my uncle been a lot of. Been a lot of people prison based, but I had one. But he been a lot of people prison based. And if it's a prison based from New Orleans, do not give him your real phone number. New Orleans. I don't know about them New Orleans babies. Yeah. Smile I might be. I might be interested in that one. <laughs> I like a I like a boot dude. I like I like some boot dude. That's how I can tell you at this time in my life. <laughs> Miss. Sorry. Okay, well, guess when I go to the prison, somebody else. This Sorry. Is, listen, this is why I've suspended the prison ministries because I'm susceptible. For prison ministries. Sorry. That's why I can't work for the prison. I can't work for the county, uh, the police department. None of that. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you recognize that because let me tell you, they know. I'm not safe around them. And they're going to throw it with everything they got. And they. Yeah, we ain't no oh, in a broken outside my damn house. Mm -mm. So let that be a cautionary tale. Prison bays are not safe. I'm not saying that people cannot be, um, they're not redeemable. And that they can't be reformed. I'm just telling you to be careful. With and the prison bed. Prison bed with a uh, corn rose and a broken. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna laugh at this whole later. I already Girl, know it. it. It was a whole mess. It was a whole mess. It was a whole mess. I I, I did not live that down for a long, long Oh, you know they're not gonna let you you know at first I know a dude's gonna let you live that down, no way. They were like, What did you do to him? <laughs> this okay. All right. So, I'll do it. All right. So yes, we did kind of take that off from Richard Ramirez and go all the way over. It was a great laugh. Yes, it was. Well, it was a great example of be careful of messing with dudes that are in prison. They are in prison for a reason. They are in court for a reason. Um, if they're being convicted of a violent crime, there's a reason why someone, a jury of their peers, found them guilty. Leave their asses alone, okay? <laughs> they're not good marriage prospects, okay? They're not. There's a lot of free men out here. Get one of them, get you an old soda, and, and call it and fix him a, a, a pepper steak and call it a day, okay? That's what you do. <laughs> that's what you do. You know, you know, so you like a uh, pepper steak and some potatoes. So yeah, that's what you get. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want to know what a sooner is, ask your old uncle, your old Shakespeare mechanic uncle Fino. He'll tell you. He'll tell you what sooner is. The show All will. Right. All right. So we are going to end the show on that note. Uh, we ran long over talking about prison bays. Um, but we'll see you next week with another story. We'll announce what that story is um, probably by Friday, just to let you know. But again, if you have any suggestions, uh, any comments, anything like that, uh, you can hit us up at info at blackcoffeecrime.com on Instagram and Facebook at Black Coffee Crime. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know if you like the show, if you don't like the show, if you talk too much, whatever. It doesn't matter because it's our show and that's what we do. But we still want to hear from you. So we want to wish you a good night. And as always, be safe, be blessed, and enjoy that second cup. And good night. Good night. Good night.